from retirement, she decided to turn her hand to the craft of crime writing. And uh, her first novel is and was The Death and Mask Murders, which I think a couple of you have read. Um, and she a, has a three book contract now with the publisher. There's going to be four books with her publisher. Her second novel is Deadly Intent, due to be published at the, oh, it's already published. <coughs> That's on the, on the rose too. Um, our range talk will cover the historical background of the desk mask murders and deadly intent and the research that was involved. This includes the Brighton Storm of 1918, the effects of the Great War, including shell shock, phrenology and death masks, the old Melbourne jail and the Ararat lunatic asylum. The police strike of 1923, among other topics. <laughs> Gentlemen, would you please welcome Lorraine Stevens. Thank you. I'm leaving out the uh, Ararat lunatic asylum today. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to thank um, Simon and Jim very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, talk to you today. Uh, my name is Lorraine Stevens. Uh, I'm no longer up there, which is good, because um, that's an older photo. And uh, uh, I'm the author of The Death Mask Murders, which came out last year, and Deadly Intent, which came out this year in, at the end of May. So I'm here to talk to you today about the historical background to my novel and the research that it involved. Uh, I just want to mention that Kate Beckett from Thesaurus Booksellers has come with me today. She's my partner in crime and uh, if you are interested in buying either of my books then she's very happy to help you there and I appreciate her attendance. Uh, a little bit about me, my background. Uh, I've lived in the Bayside suburbs just about all my life, except for about three years in rural bark, which was just a glitch on the horizon. Um, I went to Mentone Girls High, and from there, as uh, Simon said, I went... Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, Simon said... Uh, <laughs> um, I, start simple, Simon. <laughs> uh, I studied history at Melbourne University. Uh, I was very fortunate to have Western Bate as my lecturer in my third year uh, studying Australian history. And as you know, he, or well, I think you know, uh, he wrote the history of Brighton and he's a very, he was a very well regarded historian. I was a history and English teacher for about three years uh, until I suffered burnout from uh, teaching an awful lot of uh, expression. And uh, then I became a teacher librarian. I went back to uni and did a graduate diploma. And I did that for about the next 35 years, which I just loved. Uh, at the end of 2013, I decided to retire. Uh, two main reasons. I still loved what I was doing, and I thought that it was a good time to go out liking what you were doing. The second thing was that I had ideas about what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, so basically, I shook my hair out of its bun. I ripped off my string of pearls. I threw off my pink twin set, my box pleat skirt my sensible shoes and my 400 denier stockings and I put on a pair of moccasins and a tracksuit and I became a crime writer. <laughs> so, why crime? Why historical crime? Uh, first of all, uh, I loved mystery and detective stories. Uh, I first read Sherlock Holmes when I was in about year nine, form three, and got carried away by the stories. Uh, to the degree that I went to the uh, Baker Street, uh, one, uh, 221B Baker Street Museum in London to have a look at where Sherlock actually lived, where he, which he really didn't. Um, and uh, also, I've been to Maringen in Switzerland, uh, which is the, where, where the waterfall is, Reichenbach Falls, where uh, Sherlock actually fell to his death, or we thought he did, but locked in the arms of Moriarty, the arch villain. And they fell down into the waters below and got carried away in the river. So I've actually stood on the ledge where Sherlock was supposed to have had the fight with Moriarty and <laughs> fell to his death. Now, the thing that a lot of people don't know is that Conan Doyle really disliked writing the home, their home stories. And he thought it was inferior literature and he wanted to get rid of him. Hence the idea of throwing him off a waterfall. Um, so he did this in 1893. Uh, the reaction was very strong. Uh, men walked around London wearing black armbands. There were death threats. There were letters to the editor of the Strand magazine, which is where his serial was actually published. 
And ultimately, in 1901, um, the Conan Doyle actually reneged on his idea and decided to bring him back, probably influenced by the fact that there was a US magazine that offered him 45,000 pounds to bring Sherlock back to life. <coughs> so that was a huge amount in those days. Um, he's, he started writing uh, The Hand of the Baskervilles, or as my <coughs> husband calls it, The Hand of the basket bill, Basketballs, uh, which he has no respect. And then he wrote a series of short stories. But the feeling was very much that Sherlock was never the same man after he was resurrected. And I think that's probably true, except for The Hand of the Baskervilles. Uh, my love of history has been throughout my life. I can still remember sitting with Dad watching The Great War on TV. It was a BBC series back in about 1964, and I was about 12. And I, found, I was fascinated by the old films and the black and white uh, photographs. Uh, and uh, it just sparked my interest a lot then. When we moved to the Morris in 1980, uh, my first thought was, where are the Californian bungalows? Where's the old houses? Uh, because so much of it was contemporary. And by reading a book called Bayside Reflections, I found out that there'd been a big fire in 1944, which had burnt down from about the Royal Melbourne Golf Club and covered a lot of Beau Morris uh, and destroyed or damaged about 66 houses. Um, the fact of the matter was that about 200 people slept on the beach at Mentone because there was nowhere for them to go and uh, the Morris Hotel was threatened. And uh, I think if you know Talbot in Cromer Road, that's one of the few really old houses that's still left over. And I live in Oak Street and down the end of Oak Street, which, uh, partially, which was partially sealed. There are a couple of old houses down there, but the rest of it was just wiped out. Um, hence my thoughts about it. And this really sparked my interest in local history. So to write historical crime fiction, you need to do lots of research. It's not just a case of writing. Um, and my approach is quite different to a lot of other people. Uh, I actually like to choose a year. And so I do a lot of research into what happened in the year. Uh, Man-made disasters, natural disasters, politics, economics, uh, entertainment, all of that sort of thing. And uh, I came up with the year of 1918. I had an idea about a plot, which was the Death Mask Murders. But when was I going to place it? And there were two reasons why I chose 1918. Uh, the first one was because there was a great storm on the 2nd of February, 1918. And a lot of people don't know about it. I'm interested, does, does anybody here know about it? Yep, okay, only two. Um, sorry? Um, I found out that it was actually the, the biggest storm in Melbourne's recorded history. And it hit Brighton. Um, First of all, there were three storms all converged on one point. So one came from the southwest, one came from the west. It's great being here because I can look at the bay. And one came from the northwest. And they all converged on Halifax Street. Um, it lasted only two to four minutes, uh, but for my purposes, it lasted a lot longer because I thought it was the perfect opportunity to bring my two main characters together in the Death Mask Murders. There were three deaths attributed to it. There was 150,000 pounds worth of damage. Uh, the roof went off the grandstand just down near the Brighton Beach station. Um, Penny's bars were uh, basically ripped to pieces by the storm. Huge trees were uprooted. And if you want to, you can go back and have a look at some of the old newspapers because there are photos of it. The thing that really got me about this storm was the, the speed of the winds that were measured. 200 miles per hour. Now we go on about 120 kilometres per hour, but 200 miles per hour is actually between about 250 kilometres per hour and 320 kilometres per hour. Now that's a huge wind. And to give you an idea, I think um, when um, the uh, Cyclone Tracy hit, the measuring devices actually broke round about the time that this one was actually measured. So Cyclone Tracy was greater, but this one had a huge effect, but only two to four minutes worth. Uh, there are lots of photos around showing what the damage was like. And it actually lasted, uh, went up to the stage of hitting Belilla, the old um, house there, and huge trees were just pulled out and uprooted. Uh, the second reason why I thought 1918 was a good idea was because it was the last year of the Great War. And as I said, I have a, a real interest in the Great War. My grandfather and my great-great 
Uh, my great-grandfather both served at the Somme in 1917 and I have a few mementos of them. Um, and I felt it was a really interesting uh, time to choose. Uh, in 1918, Australia's population was about 5 million. Uh, 400,000 men enlisted and 60,000 died and 160,000 were wounded. And I worked in Donald for the first year of my teaching career and I saw for myself the avenues of honour and the uh, memorials that were built to, in honour of these people who died. And also the country towns that were actually uh, just lost a generation of young men. And I thought that was a very interesting thing to look at. So I was interested in two aspects of the Great War. The effect of those who were left behind and lost their loved ones and then the effect on those who actually survived it and came back very damaged psychologically and physically from what they'd experienced. Uh, the grief and loss of the people who uh, lost their loved ones in the war. Uh, I looked at a lot of stuff on shell shock. I decided to make my main character, Max, suffer from shell shock. He was a returned uh, soldier. And uh, I saw videos that are on the BBC archive I looked at a lot of things and they're very confronting because there are old films of men who were suffering from shell shock. Um, the, they were traumatised, um, they had a, a range of symptoms, so this gives you an idea about how traumatic it was. Uh, symptoms of shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder included hysteria, anxiety, paralysis, loss of appetite, limping, muscle contractions, blindness, deafness, nightmares and insomnia, heart palpitations, depression, dizziness, twitching and shaking. And so it really did have a huge effect. There seemed to be two main approaches or two forms of tra uh, treatment that were given to these people. The first was that they treated them as cowards. You're trying to get out of fighting. We're going to make sure that you suffer. And they actually gave them electroconvulsive therapy. I don't know whether therapy is the right word for it. Um, my character Max actually has um, shock treatment to his throat because he can't speak and shock treatment to his back because he couldn't walk. And I based that actually on a, on a, a case that I read about. Um, if you've read any of the poetry of Siegfried Sassoon, the great war poet, uh, he was actually treated for shell shock. And it was really, really tough stuff what they did to them. Uh, what the main aim was was to get them better and send them back to war. And when I was doing my research, I found out about one fellow who tried to enlist in Australia. They regarded him as not medically fit to serve. So he actually went to England and he joined up there. He went to the Somme and he lost an arm. They sent him back to England where he underwent rehabilitation and then they sent him back to the battlefield again and he was actually killed. So it's just incredible the thought um, that they just needed, you know, feet on the ground and that was the main thing. Now there was a second form of treatment given to people with shell shock and that was what I call an empathetic approach where they didn't treat them as cowards, they realised the psychological trauma that these people had gone through and they did their very best to make them whole again uh, by giving them various things to do, uh, it might have been some sort of craft or something like that, uh, so that they could get their minds off what they'd been through. I know my grandfather came back, uh, he used to have fits of anger He'd been gassed, um, and uh, I don't know what he was like before that, but I dare say that the war would have had a huge effect on him. Okay, what else did I research? I researched the history of the old Melbourne jail, and I have a vested interest in this because um, up until COVID, I was working as a volunteer guide there. Um, it was one of the things I wanted to do as well as write, as well as play golf. Um, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, why would I choose something like the old Melbourne jail? Uh, because I was interested in crime and punishment. I've been a teacher for 35 years, so that came naturally. <laughs> um, and I found the place fascinating. To walk off the street into the old Melbourne jail, uh, an 1852 building right in the middle of the city, opposite the old Russell Street headquarters, I found it a fascinating place to go. And um, I enjoyed looking at the, uh, learning about the place. I learnt a lot in my time there about the death masks, how they were made and why they were made. Uh, and if you go there, um, I don't know how many people have been there. Oh, it's a great place, good, I'm glad to see this lot. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is you can see one of the death masks of Ned Kelly, they actually made about 14, and I think about six exists now. One's in the State Library and one's in the Old Melbourne Jail. 
Uh, so how were the death masks made? Uh, well, first of all, what they did was, uh, and I can only talk about the people who were executed, because that was the main uh, source of it. Um, they used to cut them down from the uh, scaffold. They would take them out to the dead house, which was a little house just outside the jail in the courtyard. They would sit them up on a chair, and then they would shave the men's heads completely. As you know, um, uh, Ned Kelly had a huge big beard and plenty of hair, and they shaved his head completely. Then they put, they, oh, by the way, they didn't shave the women's heads because they didn't think it was nice to cut a woman's hair. So even though she'd just been executed. Um, so that's a double standard. Um, anyway, uh, a fellow called Max Kreitmeier, uh, he owned a, a wax museum in Burke Street in the city. And interestingly enough, I found out he was the grandfather of Frank Thring, who was the great actor. So that was interesting, the artistic side coming out. Um, but Max Kreitmeier did Ned Kelly's death mask. So, after shaving the head, they put layers of oil across the head so that the wax wouldn't stick, or the plaster. And then they put layers of plaster over the head or wax until it's set. Once that was done, they would cut it, take it off the head, put it back together again and seal it up with uh, liquid plaster, which would set. Turn it upside down and you've got a mould. And they would pour the plaster into the, the head and that would create the death mask. Now they made death masks of famous people and infamous people like Ned Kelly. Why did they make them of uh, famous people? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious. They wanted to honour them, celebrate them. And so when you go to Westminster Abbey, you see effectively on a lot of the uh, sarcophagus that are there, uh, effectively a death mask on the top showing what people look like. And tonight when you go home, put in death masks, Google it, and you will see death masks of everybody from Abraham Lincoln to Beethoven, Dante, uh, a huge amount of people. And you see what they really look like, uh, not some sort of idealised portrait um, from an artist. So why did they make them for criminals? Why would you want to celebrate a criminal? Well, they didn't. They actually wanted to be able to predict criminality before it happened. Uh, so they wanted to say, okay, this person is likely to be a criminal just by looking at their death mask. And it's all based on a science called phrenology. Anybody heard of phrenology? Yeah. Yay, good. Pseudoscience. <laughs> a pseudo pseudoscience, I should say. Um, it's the idea that the shape or contours of the head or the skull are an indication of the person's personality and that you'd be able to judge the sort of person they were. And it originated with a fellow called Franz Joseph Gull, who uh, in the 19th century came up with this idea that the brain was divided into about anything from 25 to about 36 six different sections, each one controlling some different aspect of your personality or your moral values. And so his theory differed. I mean, we do have a sort of an idea like that too. But his idea was that if you used one part of your brain more than any other, it would grow and it would push out the skull, you'd get a lump. Conversely, if you didn't use a part of your skull, of your brain rather, it would shrink and you'd get an indentation in the skull. And so by feeling the lumps and bumps on someone's head, you'd be able to work out whether or not they were this sort of person or that sort of person. Now I brought someone along today just for you. This is Fred, my phrenology head. He barracks from Melbourne. <laughs> and you can see, uh, I think you can see from here that his brain has been divided into lots of different sections. Now, if Fred were a criminal, just above the ears, there's the area called destructiveness, above and behind the ears. And um, if you use this part of your brain, if you're a criminal sort of person, are you all checking? No? Um, this part of your brain would actually start to enlarge and it would push out and you get lumps behind the ears. Conversely, if Fred were a criminal, up the top up here, there's an area called benevolence. So if you were a criminal, you're not a kind person, you're not gentle, you're not loving, and this part would shrink and you get a bit of a dip there. And so phrenologists actually had this idea that if they measured someone's head uh, and compared it as time went on, 
um, they'd be able to tell the sort of person that you were, and they'd be able to predict criminal behaviour before it actually happened. So there we go. He's very good looking, and I have him on my desk, and he never talks back. He's great. Good man to have. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting on to another very personal area, uh, and that is a family history secret. Um, so I'm about to share something with you. Uh, I was interested in the old Melbourne jail for other reasons, apart from phrenology, the death masks, and all of the history that went with it. And um, in 1929, they decided to close down the jail for two reasons. Uh, a lot of men had come back from the war, and they needed to be re-educated. Working Men's College was right behind and uh, they wanted to enlarge uh, the school that was offering uh, retraining for these uh, soldiers. So in 1924 it was unofficially shut and then in 1929 it was official. Uh, they decided that they would dig up the graveyard because right behind where the old Melbourne jail was, was a girls college. Um, now I've always thought having a perhaps a cemetery next to a school was a pretty good idea, um, but that was a joke, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, anyway, they decided to dig up the graves, and in doing so, they actually knocked off the top of uh, what they thought was Ned Kelly's uh, coffin, and it had about two other people in it. Now, one thing you may not know is that uh, when they actually buried these criminals, they often made what they call, uh, got a blue stone and they engraved into it the initials of the person who died. So the E.K. stone could have been Edward Kelly, but it also could have been Ernest Knox, who was another man who was actually um, uh, executed there. Uh, not very far from here, up at Grand Point, is uh, a seawall. They used a lot of those stones from uh, the old Melbourne jail to build the seawalls during the 1930s. So the Sussos, or the sustenance men, uh, were paid the doll to do work, community work. And they built the seawalls along Mentone and, and Brighton. And one of those stones up at Grand Point is actually the MN stone, which stands for Martha Needle. And I saw a photo of it not so long ago. They had it in one of the papers because the sand had worn away and it showed uh, her stone. So they used the stones a lot. So they're digging up the graveyard um, and they knock off the top of um, the uh, uh, coffin, Nick Kelly's lid or coffin, and some of the working men's college boys rushed in, they were students and they stole some of the bones, they took skulls. Even the working men did that. Well, sorry, even the workmen did that too. And uh, here's a couple of actual papers. Ned Kelly's grave, Friday's disgraceful scene, Premier orders investigation, and that's dated uh, age Monday, April the 15th, 1929. This one here from uh, the Border Watch, and this is, just, this is a complete reprint of the paper itself. A coffin unearthed, supposed to be Ned Kelly's remains. Schoolboys scramble for bones. Now this is where I have to admit something. My father was one of those schoolboys. <laughs> <laughs> it's growing. You've still got the bones. <laughs> so Dad and about three of his mates broke into the, um, the cemetery and stole some stuff. And the next day they got called in by the headmaster of Working Men's College. Dad was doing civil engineering there. He was 17 in 1929. And they were told to bring back the bones and the skull of Ned Kelly, otherwise they'd be expelled. And so they did. But my father said he never actually had Ned Kelly's skull. It was one of his mates. Yeah. But my father was never um, the type of person who'd embellish his story. I never doubted that it didn't happen. But when I actually went to work at the jail, I found out for sure it did. Now, just harking back to, oh yeah, uh, I've only told about 30,000 people about this, so I'd rather you keep quiet. <laughs> okay. So, harking back to um, phrenology, there's one thing I forgot to tell you. you it's an old uh, science that went out of um, uh, use, I suppose, by the end of the 1800s. But we still use expressions that are used in phrenology. Uh, if you say that someone is highbrow, it means that they like, you know, art, uh, opera, ballet, that sort of thing. For example, Melbourne supporters. <laughs> and if you talk about someone being lowbrow, again, shape of the head, 
then who do you think that would be? Come on, come on. Well done. Collingwood. Collingwood. <laughs> Person lacking taste, that's right. Um, if you talk about someone being well-rounded, that also comes from phrenology, and it's a person who's got a nice, balanced personality. Uh, if you say to someone, you should get your head red, which I've had said to me frequently, um, then that also comes from phrenology, the reading of the, the, the head, the shape of the head. So I found that sort of thing really fascinating. So, um, moving on. Uh, Deadly Intent, my second book. What sort of research did I have to do for this? Uh, the main one I'm going to talk about is the police strike of 1923. Uh, three days of chaos, they called it. So on the 31st of October, 1923, 600 members of the police, the Victoria Police Force went on strike. That was about a third of the police. Uh, why? Uh, they had long hours, they had low pay, they didn't get a pension, uh, and if their uh, widows uh, were left after their husband had died on duty, uh, she didn't get a pension. Uh, they had to buy their own uniforms. Uh, they were walking around on the beat. If they weren't married, they actually had to sleep in a dormitory with about 10 other constables. Uh, only the married men were allowed to go and sleep in their own houses. So it was pretty hard. And then the final sort of straw for them was that uh, the Chief Commissioner of Police appointed about uh, four what they called spooks, or special, um, special uh, people to keep an eye on the constables on the beat and actually make sure they were doing their job properly. And as a result, the police thought, enough's enough, we're going on strike. Now, over in New South Wales, they're getting a lot more pay, less hours, they're getting a lot more benefits than what they were getting in Victoria. And uh, consequently, 600 members of the police force went on strike, which was a huge effect. Now, of course, Melburnians being Melburnians, they thought, yahoo! Let's get into the city and have some fun. So they went in there, they got drunk, they looted the shops, they broke windows, they had a ball. And there were no police to speak of, maybe three or four poor constables who had to try and enforce it. Um, nearly every shop in the, uh, well, sort of like from Burke Street uh, down to about Flinders uh, Street and uh, Swanson and Elizabeth Street, just about all of those shop windows were broken and uh, trams were set alight and pushed over, hard to believe. Um, and the thing that really got me, because I've got a bit of an odd sense of humour, uh, if you can remember the Leviathan men's clothing, clothing store, they had a sign in their, their shop window which said, Genuine Clearing Sale. <laughs> and that's exactly what the, um, the, the mob did. They cleared out the Leviathan. <laughs> um, there was a Royal Commission and all of the demands were actually given into. Uh, they had everything granted uh, that they'd asked for. But the amazing thing was that not one single police sergeant or constable got their job back who went on strike. So that was the end of their career. Um, there's a lot more to do with the deadly intent that I wrote about. How am I going for time here? Good. 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 Three minutes? Three minutes? Right, I can do that. Um, a Deadly Game, which is my third book, which is coming out next year, uh, is actually set in 1925 in Richmond, and uh, I'm writing a lot about the gambling dens and the illegal booze, um, so some of you will really enjoy that. Um, and of course, Squizzy Taylor. Um, I found out a lot about Squizzy that I didn't know. He was called Squizzy because he had a squint. And he had a lot of other names too. I'm trying to remember, Leslie, Joseph, uh, Theodore, Taylor, I think it was his actual name. He wore patent leather shoes, fawn gloves, silk socks, diamond rings, silk ties, a uh, diamond pin in his knitted silk tie. He smoked expensive cigars and he had gold teeth. He was known for fixing juries, uh, robbery and murder, and he was as slippery as an eel. So they just couldn't get him. Um, but what I loved was a couple of things I heard, and that was uh, when his house was raided by Detective Sergeant um, Piggott, or Detective Inspector Piggott, they found him sitting up in bed in pink silk pyjamas. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I loved... What's wrong with that? We're on every night, Tom. The other thing, too, was his very first armed robbery uh, he was so disorganised that he forgot to get a, a getaway car and he had to hire a taxi on the bed. <laughs> so when I do my research into these books, I use the newspapers from the time a great deal. Uh, I find out about the entertainment, I'm interested in uh, 
all the things that are going on at the time, um, things like how to, I actually teach myself how to drive the cars at the time because I want to know whether it's a four gear shift or it's got a crank, you have to crank it to get it started or whatever. Uh, I like to know about things like the furniture, the architecture, uh, the public transport. I found out that Sandringham didn't have an electric train until 1919 and it was the first line in the city that had electricity, so that was something. And uh, I just like to know what's going on at the time, and the local papers are the best, oh, sorry, the papers are the best for it. So if you haven't done it, you should get onto Trove, T-R-O-V-E, from the National Library, and start having a look, and you can find out all sorts of things in there about your family or anything. I found a photo of my mother when she was a bridesmaid, um, so I thought that was terrific. Um, and I also do things like look at the maps and work out how long it takes to walk from one place to another. And uh, it really is a great, great deal of fun doing the research, actually. So on that note, um, I'll just mention Kate down the back there, the lovely Kate, if you'd like to buy one of my books. Uh, I'm happy to sign them too. And I also wanted to thank um, very much you having me today. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. That's, that's just been wonderful. I'm, I'm um, like another, I feel like we're feeling much. <laughs> <laughs>